Welcome to Junior Curator Academy, your inside look under the cone. I'm Sophie. And I'm David. Join us as we fuel your curiosity, ignite exciting ideas, and discover new ways of being creative. On this episode of Junior Curator Academy, we're going to learn about artists Jerry Hovenek and Ralph Harvey and their amazing sculpture based on and inspired by the Magic Flute, which is a singspiel like a musical today. And remember, all activities are aligned with Washington State standards and are easily accessible to assist home learners and educators fulfill academic credits. These are the Junior Curator key terms that will be used in this episode of Junior Curator Academy. Parents and teachers are urged to use these key terms in conjunction with the episode to impart lessons that follow Washington State education standards. Please remember the key terms can be accessed at any point during this episode by following the link. Watch and listen with your Junior Curator Scholar and help them identify these words as the episode goes along. We hope you enjoy the show. Oh, hello. Sorry guys, I was engrossed in looking at all these amazing little characters. Of course you are. That's what we're here to talk about today. There are 18 of them and they are all characters from an opera called The Magic Flute, which was composed by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and was first performed in 1791 in Vienna, Austria. Did you know that the words were written by Mozart's friend, a performer by the name of Emmanuel Schikaneder? The opera included singing and talking just like a musical today. Wow, I did not know that. The story of this opera is very interesting. The magic flute is a fairy tale of darkness, light, and finding your way in the world. The story utilizes Masonic and ancient Egyptian mythology as a means to tell the story. A handsome prince, Tamino, sets out on an adventure to rescue damsel in distress, Pamina. He has a magic flute to protect him. He takes along a timid bird catcher. Papagino, who is more interested in finding a wife than seeking adventure. Along the way, they meet a queen of the night who is not as nice as she seems, an evil villain, Monostatos. Tamino, Papagino, and Pamina, guided by the high priest, Sorostro, must trust in the power of music to lead them through the darkness and dangerous adventures ahead. Sophie, how about a family activity? Okay. This one is called Round Robin Storytelling. Create a fast fairy tale with your family. All you need is a minute timer and your imagination. First, choose a title or theme with your family. Sit in a circle and designate who will start the story and which direction you will move around the circle. Set your timer for one minute and begin your story. Once your minute is up, reset the timer and the next participant will continue the story where the first family member left off. Continue in this manner until your story comes to a fantastic ending. Great, back to the magic flute. Let's revisit the artist who made this wonderful and whimsical artwork. Let's begin with Jerry Hovenek. Jerry was originally a potter, but he switched to glass blowing after a friend told him that his pots were boring. He embarked on an intensive glass program at Pendlin School of Crafts with Fritz Dreisbach. In 1986, Jerry and his friend Ralph Harvey got together to make a series of sculptures inspired by Mozart's opera. Can you guess which one? The Magic Flute! You got it! With the help of a group of students, they worked together drawing and blowing the forms of various characters in the opera while listening to the opera at full volume. Jerry says, we were totally immersed in magic flute designs with the Bergman film. We produced the entire cast over a 10 day period. Mozart was one of the greatest composers of all time. He was a child prodigy who learned to play the piano at the young age of three. Mozart composed great works as a child and teenager. His father was difficult and exploited his talent for money. This caused stress and anger between them and eventually ended the relationship. Mozart composed one masterpiece after another, totaling over 600 compositions. 
He often wrote with no corrections. He worked very hard, but never seemed to have much money, and unfortunately died at the young age of 36 in 1791. The Magic Flu is one of his greatest masterpieces. How about a family activity, Sophie? Yes, I have a good one. What kind of music can you and your family make with instruments and sound makers found in your home? Can you alter common household items to create new instruments? Work together and compose a mini masterpiece of sound. Now, let's take a look at these pieces Jerry and Ralph made. First, we have Tamino. He is the young prince who sets out to rescue his princess with his magic flute. Next, we have the queen of the night. She is introduced as a desperate mother whose beloved daughter is kidnapped. Ultimately, she is proven to be the villain of the story. She tries to steal the powerful circle of the sun and in the end is vanquished and cast into eternal darkness. Her arias are among the most famous in all of opera. Here we have Pamina, the heroine of the story. She is the daughter of the Queen of the Night. Pamina is given a dagger by the Queen of the Night who orders her to kill Sir Ostro. Sir Ostro is the high priest of the sun, the head council of priest Isis in Osiris. He is initially thought to be the evil captor of Pamina, but later is discovered that he is benevolent and the leader of the community. The three ladies of the night are the ones who do the queen's bidding. Monostatos is the mean and greedy servant of Sorostro. His henchmen aid in the capture and imprisonment of Pamina. He is eventually cast out by Sorostro with the queen. The hedgehog represents the animals tamed by Tamino's flute. The dragon attacks Tomino in the opening scene of the opera. It is killed by the ladies of the night. The pyramid sculpture represents the temple of Sir Astro. These are the three spirit boys that are sent to guide Papa Gino and Tomino on their dangerous journey ahead. Here we have Papa Gino, a bird catcher who becomes Tomino's sidekick. He's a simple guy who just wants a girlfriend. His mouth is locked as punishment by the Queen of the Night for telling lies. Papa Gina is a cheerful girl who goes around disguised as an old woman until she unites with Papa Gino at the end of the opera. Finally, we have the magic bells. They were a gift to Papa Gino used to cast spells. I think that's all of them. I think you're right. All of these pieces made by Jerry and Ralph were inspired by Ingmar Bergman's film, The Magic Flute. This influential film was produced in 1975 and was first released in Sweden. Bergman made a few changes to the original script. For example, he makes Sir Astro Pamina's father who didn't approve of the Queen of the Night's influence on his daughter. This part wasn't in the original story. Part of what makes this film so spectacular was the fact that it was produced as a theatrical event. The Magic Flute was shot on 16 millimeter film with stereo sound. It was hugely popular with the audiences of its time. You can watch the entire movie using the link on the screen. While this film was groundbreaking and the original opera by Mozart was regarded as genius, Mozart and Schikaneder were living in the 18th century. Many of their ideas about identity, both social and political, are outdated. The magic flute has been criticized heavily for themes that are not accepted in contemporary societies. Some recent productions have cleaned up problematic moments in the opera. Some people approve of this and some don't. Read the article by Dr. Luke Howard and watch Bergman's version of the movie. You can decide where you stand. I had the opportunity to ask Dr. Howard some questions about the magic flute the other day. He really helped me understand multiple viewpoints and some of these issues. Let's take a look. Hi, Dr. Howard. Thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure. 
Was the Queen of the Night evil because she was a woman with power? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, and I don't even think she's evil. Um, the Queen of the Night uh, has a real gripe. I mean, her daughter was kidnapped. He might be setting up the stereotype of the crazy, authoritarian, powerful woman just to scuttle it by the end of the opera. Um, so I, I, and I don't think the Queen of the Night is evil at all. She's certainly not evil like some other characters in Mozart's operas can be. Uh, she is uh, disappointed. She's frustrated. Uh, she's angry, uh, perhaps even desperate. Uh, but she, I don't believe, is an evil character. How do you think the idea of man and woman being able to reach God couple status translates to society today in light of ideas about sexual preference? Is this another bias that could be found in the play? Yes. Um, uh, of course, opera has been almost exclusively heteronormative uh, from the beginning. Uh, the, the tenor gets the soprano and they live happily ever after after at the end or not, or, you know, they, they die tragically at the end, but it's always, it's always the tenor and the soprano. Um, and, uh, and so this is no different from really any other opera written before world war two. Uh, but as I was saying before, in today's society, we need to be thinking about these kinds of questions and, um, addressing them or looking for answers or solutions in the opera. Uh, that will help audiences uh, address these questions. It, and it'll take some, uh, some brave moves on the part of opera, company, uh, opera companies and some audience education uh, for this to work. But for instance, what if we had a countertenor sing the role of Papagena and the, the pair of Papageno and Papagena uh, are a same-sex couple? It doesn't do any violence to the music at all, but it would raise a question. It would it would kind of bing to the audience as, ha, huh, how does this work? What would it look like? What if Zarastro was sung by a mezzo-soprano instead of uh, uh, a basso profundo? What if it was a, a female priest who was initiating uh, Tamino and Pamina into the uh, the order? Um, I think these are these are production possibilities that are certainly viable and would be challenging and uh, would raise questions. Working through those questions would lead us to some understanding. Um, and I think this is what art is about. I mean, art isn't about uh, being very prosaic and direct and documentary-like. Art is meant to challenge us. It's meant to strike us from an unusual angle to show us a different viewpoint. And so I don't mind at all using art like the magic flute or, or whatever, uh, to ask these difficult questions uh, in ways that can prompt people to, to think deeper and further about the answers. Do you think it is fair to discuss ideas about gender equality versus misogyny and racial equality as it is viewed today through the vehicle of this 18th century opera? Uh, yes, I think not only is it fair, I think it's necessary. Um, as we look to our past, and as a, a person of, of white European male legacy, uh, we, we've got a lot of, of soul searching to do uh, with our past. Uh, and I think, um, I think that's, uh, that's crucial. As a historian, I also think it's crucial to understand what happened in that historical moment on its own terms. And so I, I think part of my job as a historian is to help people understand why things happened the way they did, how they happened, not just what happened, and then examine that from our current perspective. What do we make of that? Thank you, Dr. Howard. Thank you, Sophie. Been a pleasure. Now let's look at one of the characters from Jerry and Ralph's point of view as artists. I am choosing the Queen of the Night. One very interesting fact is that Jerry didn't start out as a glass artist. You remember that he was a ceramicist, possibly inspired by the funk movement. Although he studied ceramics at Slippery Rock College in Philadelphia, in 1969, remember from our last episode, funk was an anti-establishment movement and was figurative in large part as a reaction to expressionism. 
The word funk comes from jazz music, and the word funky means quirky. Funk was popular in the 1960s and 70s in California. When you look at the sculpture of the Queen of the Night, what do you see, Jabari? The Queen of the Night piece is very interesting. It stands out amongst all the other magic flute pieces. The angles and undulations of forms in the sculpture imply movement. The figure holds a marble-like orb meant to be the sun in her hand, and the sun was crafted as the only translucent piece in the collection. This aesthetic choice draws the eye to this object in her hand. The other hand motions to herself. This gesture is often used historically in paintings in the depiction of religious figures. Some artists rendered themselves in this fashion with their hands blessing themselves in self-portraits. The mouth of the figure is wide open with her head tilted back. This signifies the singing of one of the more famous arias in all of opera. Her robe is darker than all the other colors given to the other sculptures. The way she is depicted is meant to be both beautiful, yet also capture the nefarious nature of her character. In many ways, the Queen of the Night sculpture is the central piece of the grouping. She sounds pretty scary. I think she is, Sophie. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time to talk to us about this piece, Jabari. It was my pleasure. To bring our episode to a close today, we brought in our community music scholar, Joe Williams, to say a few words about the sculpture and Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute. Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me. Indeed, indeed. Let's get right to it. Um, the Queen of the Night has one of the most memorable arias in all of opera. Could you kind of tell us what makes it so important? Sure. It's very catchy and recognizable. And uh, one thing that makes it so famous is its tessitura, or range. Mm. So it's actually for coloratura, which is a specific type of soprano, which is very, very high. So she's way up in the stratosphere of a very high F as a top note. So when we think of really high singers, we might think of like Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, or if you're an opera fan, Kathleen Battle, Sumi Jo. Uh, these are the highest voice types in an opera. And the Queen of the Night, she uses a lot of staccato detached notes. <laughs> Stuff like that, it's kind of laughing and comical, of course. And it's a great juxtaposition between serious and uh, light. I, I have one more question for you. I understand that this uh, opera is called uh, Shingspiel. Uh, can you understand, uh, I guess, break down the difference between a singspiel and other operas? Yeah, absolutely. So, Singspiel is a type of opera, um, came to rise in the 18th century. It's basically zing, sing, spiel, play. Mm. Um, so, there's definitely a com comedic undertone to it. Uh, I like to equate it to like a musical because there's both talking and singing. So it's kind of a different variety of having the plot, uh, both musical and in dialogue. Okay, okay. Well, thank you so much for coming in and um, just bringing some light to the musical half of, of these sculptures. Uh, so thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, my pleasure, thanks. All right. Now that we have analyzed these works from a multitude of angles and perspectives, it's your turn. Today, we looked at the sculpture, The Magic Flute by Jerry and Ralph. We learned about Mozart's magic flute, and now as part of your junior curator assignment, you choose a piece and describe it. Describe what you see for us. Send it to us at juniorcurator at museumofglass.org. Join us next time where we'll look at Nancy Callan's Captain America 2 and explore mentors and heroes. Thanks for watching Junior Curator Academy. Your inside look under the cone. Until, Until next, next time, time. bye. bye.